Yeah, but what I want to do today is walk through a little bit of a project that I put together for Open Data Week, doing some mapping of New York City rooftops. Maybe I'll stop here and uh, also introduce myself. I'm Patrick Mayer. I'm a software engineer living in, in New York City. Um, been in New York uh, quite a while now, probably closing in on 15 years. And I've I've done a lot of work in the, I do a lot of work with Python and I've done a lot of work with the geospatial stuff in the past. So I wanted to put something together for people who are interested in this sort of thing. The basic idea of what I want to show you guys is making some interesting topographic maps by using a couple of different data sets. So topographic maps are something that you typically use to visualize geographic terrain. And they're a way of showing elevation by drawing contours of different colors to, to show the height of geographic features. So they're commonly used for visualizing like the surface of the earth. But New York City is a, a really cool geographic area. And there's also this blend between the natural features that we think and also the man-made structures like the buildings that dominate the skyline. And so we're going to try to combine a couple of data sets today and make some maps that sort of use this geographic language, but reflect uh, a lot of the man-made features and like how we perceive the city. So there's two main data sets that I'm going to be working with. Both of them open New York City data sets. So the first one here is called the one foot digital elevation model. So this is a LIDAR generated data set that maps the elevation above sea level uh, at a really fine resolution of the entire city of New York. So this is a really cool data set. And then the second one is the building footprints data set. And you can see from all of these red dots showing up here, uh, this is a really big data set containing information about every structure in New York City, both the footprint on the ground and the height of the building. I'm doing this inside what's called a Google CoLab. This is Google's kind of hosted version of a Jupyter notebook. It's a really convenient way to just start writing some Python code, playing with data. And they also give you like a really version of Python. So without having to worry about all of the like headaches of installing the correct packages and getting your distribution to work, you can just get some code up and running in a cloud interface. You can actually run all of this code yourself. So the first commands here are actually not Python commands, these little exclamation points mean that you're running uh, code in a bash shell. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. What these commands do is they are just, I, I have here like the static links to the assets from the New York City data set. And we're just going to download these data sets. They're zip files. Uh, we're going to unzip them. Uh, and get rid of that zip file. And so I've already run this code prior to the meeting starting. So this takes a couple of minutes because the data sets are a little big if you're doing it yourself, but you can just uh, run these. This is how we're getting our data set loaded onto our machine that's providing our, our Python environment here. And this command just like shows that I've downloaded everything. And the first thing I wanna call out when we're looking at this data is that it's really big some of it, right? Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the file for that digital elevation map that I talked about. It's 3.2 gigabytes. That's what this 3.2 G here is. So it's a really big, uh, really high resolution image. And you can see uh, some of these building files. Building.shp is what contains like the most dense information about the building footprints. This is 200 megabytes, not three gigabytes, but still pretty big. And so one of the things when we work with this data is we're going to have to be very careful about what kinds of things we load into memory and how we read our data sets. Because if you have any experience working with data sets this big, that stuff can either run really slow or maybe even crash your machine if you're loading things up incorrectly. So one of the things I, I want to touch on here is some of the cool Python tools that allow us to work with this big data set and still produce some really nice maps. So the next thing I'm doing here is just installing some extra packages that I'm going to be using. As I said, this uh, collab environment comes with a bunch of stuff already installed, but these are some extra things related mostly to geospatial analysis that are going to be useful. I'll talk about them in more detail as we get to that part in the code. So now actually entering like the Python part here. If you're not very familiar with Python, it's a really great language. It is really flexible and it has a huge and like a uh, community of developers. And so there's libraries for almost everything. It's a great language if you're trying to combine different pieces of things together. There's almost always some package out there that's going to help you out. For those who are maybe that are more familiar with Python, I'll call out some of these uh, packages as, as I go through them. But for now, this is just preparing everything I'm going to need. So now let's dig into actually how we're actually going to work with this data. Talking about the 
the digital elevation map first. That was our big TIFF file that I pointed out. So we'd like to we'd like to maybe just start by looking at that. Uh, so this is because it's a TIFF file. It's what we call raster data, which means that it's stored like an image in a grid where there's a value at every single cell of the grid. And because this, again, image is so large, we can't just load it into memory and look at it. Instead, we're going to use a library called GDAL. I can show you the link here. This has all of the APIs and stuff, but this is a really great set of tools for working with geospatial data sets. And it has a Python interface. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to define a set of operations we want to do on the image without actually loading all of that data up. And then at the end, we can issue a command that'll execute it and it'll run through that data in like an efficient streaming manner. And so we can do all of our kind of resizings and reprojections and stuff like that, but do it in a way that our computer can handle. So this first command here, when I say gdoll.open, again, this is actually not opening the image. It's just pointing to it and it like knowing some metadata about the image, but without pulling in all of the, the pixel data. I can see, I can actually take a look at what the resolution of this image is. And you can see here, it's like over 150,000 pixels in both dimensions. So again, really big. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this down to a really reasonable width. So I'm, I'm, this is 500 pixels here. Uh, you could go higher if you want to make things higher resolution, but this is just going to give me uh, really something that's really easy to work with. All of my commands will be pretty snappy in the command line. And so I'm loading up that image and scaling it to 500 pixels, it's going to automatically scale the height to an appropriate pixel width as well. And I'm giving it a, a different name. So one thing when we're working with this kind of geospatial data, it's always really, to, it's always really important to be aware of what coordinate system you're working in and what projection you're using. If you have any familiarity with geospatial data, you probably know about some of these concerns, but there's all sorts of ways you can plot a map of the earth. You can do uh, a Mercator projection or a conical projection or all sorts of different kinds of projections. I see a, a question in the chat there. Uh, can the collabs handle the original data size or scaling down necessary? Uh, you can actually see up here the, this tells you a little bit about the actual machine that you're getting access to when you're running a collab. So what you can see is that the hard disk, this disk bar is pretty big, right? You get like tens of gigabytes, right? Let's say. And so you can download the data just fine. You can see that the RAM is like maybe 12 gigabytes, they're saying. Maybe you could just barely fit the loaded up image into memory, depending on how it's stored in memory. But in general, I think a three gigabyte image loading it up into memory, it's not going to be able to handle it very well. Even if you can handle it, it's going to be slow. But so back to this idea of projection, right? We also need to work in a coordinate system. You're probably familiar with latitude and longitude. Those are really, that's a really common coordinate system, but it's not very good for doing these kinds of raster maps because the units of latitude and longitude aren't consistent measurements of physical area. So if you think about the lines of latitude, as they go, they get closer together. And that means that the width uh, or the, the size of a degree of, sorry, of longitude is going to get smaller as you move around the map. So instead, there's this alternative system called easting and northing. And what it allows us to do is just define distance from an origin in some unit. And in these coordinates, it's really easy to make our pixels all of the same size. So we know that a pixel in the up-down direction is the same uh, number of feet as the pixels in the left-right direction. And specifically, the projection for this data set, for both of the data sets we'll be working with actually, is this, it's called the New York Long Island State Coordinate System. And all of our units of measurement are gonna be in uh, United States feet. So you can see that information here if I do this get projection command. This will tell you all the nitty gritty details about what projection you're working in. Another thing I'm going to need to do if I want to construct these maps is I need to understand like the X and Y coordinates or my, my axes basically. So what I'm doing here is uh, defining a function that's going to take my image and tell me what the, the X and Y axis are. If you're not familiar with this sort of notation in Python, this is a newer Python feature, this colon and then something after it, same with this arrow. These are called type annotations, and they're just a way of giving your, your users a hint about what your function should take in. So here we're going to take in like a, this GDAL data set, and we're going to return a tuple of two arrays, uh, which are going to have our coordinates in them. And then so finally here, I can issue this read as array command. So this is going to do that transformation that I talked about pull in my data as a matrix in what's called uh, NumPy. That's the package in Python that's like the standard for handling matrix data. Uh, and I'm going to get my X and Y cord. So now I'm ready to do some plotting. And I'm going to start by using this library called matplotlib for doing the plotting. 
It's really like the workhorse of plotting in the Python ecosystem. It's really flexible, really powerful. There's some more specialized geospatial libraries, but Map, Matplotlib makes it really easy to customize and get the plot to do exactly whatever you want. So I've written this function here. Again, we're going to, what it's going to take in is going to be our X and Y axis, our image, right? So this is whatever image we want, like a, a matrix we want to plot. Uh, and then an argument to specify how big the figure is in the output, the number of contour levels that we want to plot. And then I have, yeah, this is just some styling options. So whether to fill in the contours, whether to include a color scale and like manual max value, if we want to adjust that color scale a little bit. So what you can see in this function is I'm generating a basic plot and some axes. And then I'm doing some logic here to create like kind of a custom color scale that's going to be useful for plotting these contour maps. So what I want to do is I want to have blue as my base color at zero. And then I want to have this predefined, I want to use this color scale called terrain, which Matplotlib provides, which is going to give us a really common color scale for geospatial visualization. And then depending on whether I'm doing filled contours or not, I either use the contour F or the contour function from Matplotlib and uh, do some more scaling including this is an important setting the aspect ratio to this this equal setting is what's going to make sure that all of my pixels correspond to the same physical dimension right so after all of that i can run this and i get this nice contour plot here and so this is the physical so again this is just the lidar data and this is the physical elevation of New York. So you can see some really cool striking features here. I'm on the Upper West Side right now. And I'd actually, I already knew that when they say things like Morningside Heights and Hamilton Heights, this refers to some physical elevation that you can see. But you can also see some features that are maybe uh, that personally I didn't know about. So I lived in Brooklyn for five years, I think, but I didn't know there was this really striking ridge running all the way through Queens and Brooklyn. And I did not know that the point the of natural highest natural elevation is a place called Todd. T-O-D-T -T Hill in Staten Island. So an interesting fact. Um, yeah, just quickly, uh, I'll point out another uh, way we can do this plotting using a library called Plotly, which Matplotlib produces uh, what are called raster graphics. They, they give you a like an image at the end. Plotly produces what are called uh, vector graph. And what this means is that it gives, it produces JavaScript output that you can actually render in the browser. And so again, most of this code is pretty similar here. There's just a little bit of difference for the actual libraries. And what this produces is a an interactive JavaScript plot. So this is cool because now we can actually, if we, we can zoom in by using some of these interactive tools, we can pan around. So this is a really nice library for working in these Colabs or Jupyter notebooks. The one downside is that for really big data sets, this is going to get to start this is this will start to get slower. Having all of this data living in the browser can make things chug a little bit. So now I want to start working with the building height data. So this is basically our natural elevation, but let's bring in the elevation that comes from all of our buildings. So this data set that we're going to be working with, I, so they prov the, the data set provides the building heights in two formats, either with uh, polygons defining the base of the building or just a point, like a single coordinate at the center of the building. So to start, we're just going to use those cor that coordinate data set. It's this building P for point, because if we're going to be plotting the whole city, the resolution is going to be such that it's not really going to make a difference whether we have the whole building footprint or not. So now to read this data set, I'm going to use this library called Fiona, which is a, a good Python library for working with a geospatial shape data. And another trick here uh, that I want to point out is, so you can see that I'm using Fiona to open this, and then I'm pulling some images, like constructing some dictionaries out of that data and loading it up into a pandas data frame. Pandas is like the standard for working with tabular data in Python. But I, I have this TQDM thing here. Uh, this is a really nice little package when you're working with big data sets in Python. And what it does is it just gives you an interactive progress bar. So I'll actually run this command right now. And what you'll see is that it does this like dynamic loading bar. This is actually, I think, a really like important trick when you're working with big data is knowing if you're running a command that's going to take a while, is it going to take a minute, an hour, uh, a day? Is it going to finish at all, right? And so this lets you work with these big data sets, but know if you're doing stuff that's going to finish or not. Uh, so when I look at this, this data frame that I eventually construct, I can see that I have uh, a few things here, an X coordinate, a Y coordinate. Again, every row here is a different building. And then a column called ground to roof and roof elevation, or sorry, ground elevation. So ground elevation is the sea level, elevation above sea level in feet of the base of the building. 
And ground to roof is the elevation from that ground to the rooftop in feet. Okay. And then these X and Y coordinates, uh, you might look at them and say, gosh, what's that? These are these easting and northing coordinates again that I was talking about. And uh, you might wonder, like, how can we work with these if we, these look pretty unfamiliar? If you want to translate these into more familiar coordinates, so we can use this PyProj library, which is a great library in Python for managing conversions between these different geospatial projections. So you can see here the projection for the data I'm working with is again this NAD83 New York Long Island state plane system. I can load up a different projection. This 4326 is a really standard latitude longitude projection. And I can create a transformer that's going to let me convert from that data projection into my lat long projection. This first row, I take the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and given it give it to that transformer. What I get out is a latitude and longitude coordinate. And if you roughly the latitude where New York City is on a map, this is a, a latitude longitude coordinate that's you know inside New York City. So now I've got I've got my building heights and I've got them all in a big list. So if you look here, uh, this actually shows how many rows this iterated through. Uh, this is over a million individual building heights that I've loaded up. So this is a lot of data. But if I want to combine these, I have to deal with the fact that my elevation map is in a raster format and my building heights are in a vector format. They are just specifying these single points. So if I want to combine these, I need to do some kind of conversion. And since we want to make maps, it makes sense for me to convert my building height vector data into a raster map. But we need to be a little careful when we do this. So typic so one way to convert vector data into a raster map is to do some kind of sampling. So you create like a grid of evenly spaced points and you sample the vector data that's closest to those points. But because uh, we're interested not just in what's a nearby building, but we, we probably wanna know what's the tallest nearby building. That's really what gives us our sense of like the topography of New York City's buildings. So we need to make sure that every point is considered. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna build ourselves a grid and then we're gonna group by these grid points and take the maximum building height for each grid point. So that's what I'm doing in this code here. I am building my grid. So I've created a grid that's 200 feet in size. And so I'm turning my X point, I'm creating grid points off of my X and Y coordinates. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm calculating the total elevation above ground, sorry, above sea level of the rooftop, uh, because that's ultimately what I want to plot. The group by that I talked about is right here. So what this is doing is looking for each grid point, what's the tallest roof. And with a little more massaging, this is what I get out. So now I just have at every grid point, what is the tallest elevate in that grid point. But this again, so I just have a list of the grid points here. What I need to do though is transform it into actually to a matrix so that I can plot it. So this is going to involve some of the matrix manipulation the, in NumPy in, Pan, in uh, Python. And so what I'm, I'm doing here is basic defining like a blank matrix. I'm filling it with what's called a not a number in NumPy. And then I'm using the indexing syntax for matrices to specify the, the indices and setting those equal to the corresponding. So if you're not familiar with working with these advanced indices in, in NumPy and Pandas, this is a really powerful notation that, that Python allows where you can do a lot of cool data manipulation in a really concise way. One maybe a wrinkle here that I'll point out. Typically when we're doing map or, or plotting, we like to express things in the X coordinate first and then the Y coordinate. But when we're working with matrices, this is just like mathematicians having a little bit of a uh, you know, different notation. With matrices, you usually specify the row index and then the column index. But if you think about like the row index, when you're looking at a matrix laid out, the row is like how far up and down and the column is how far left and right. So the Y and the X index are actually uh, flipped in some of these operations. So this can get a little confusing, but that's a source of that like slightly weird ordering. And then the last thing I'm doing here is just, again, constructing my X and Y axes so that I can use them when I plot. So we can take a quick look at the data after all of this. And after all of this kind of gridding and taking the maximum height and stuff like that, uh, this is just a, a quick plot uh, of the building heights data now as a raster map. And that's great. We can really obviously see that this is New York City. We buildings cover almost the entire space. And so it's not surprising that we see uh, a really clear outline of the city. But there's a few issues here. So one is that you can see that like 
In some areas, we've got some gaps because of like big streets or parks or other features. Another is that there's a lot of just uh, speckle and noise because in some parts of the city, you might have a really tall building and then 200 feet over, uh, there's a very short building. And so it's not going to give us a very smooth feature set or a very smooth uh, surface. And in order to handle both of these, what we can do is we can do a little bit of smoothing ourselves and define a way of averaging out a little bit. And that's going to give us like a more even visual representation of all of these changes in height. Again, how we do the smoothing, we want to think about a little bit, right? So typically, so when you think about smoothing an image, right, there's op these operations called convolutions, right? Where you take a little window, slide it across the image, and in each window you do some averaging. And that result gives you like a, little, a more blurred out image. But we actually don't want to just do like a simple average because we want to preserve the fact like that for our tallest buildings, we want to preserve those really tall heights. If we do just an average, the tall buildings will become a little shorter. The short buildings will become a little taller, right? We want to preserve that the, the height of the tallest buildings. And so what this code does is this is maybe the, the, the mathiest part, but this is defining what's called a, a kernel for convolution, which is just one of these little windows, like how much averaging to do. And then a custom smoothing function that's going to do max operation to preserve the height of the tall buildings. So it, it does a smoothing, but then takes the max with the, the center pixel, which is going to like preserve that the height of the the building and what i'm plotting here is just a, an actual visualization of what that kernel looks like it's just again a little width that runs between uh zero and one one at the center and going to zero towards the edges so this indicates that we're just smoothing most closely in our nearby neighbors and running to yeah less less smoothing as we go farther away this kind of filtering is done uh, via a, a function called generic filter from the sand so what i'm going to pass it is that that height data. So that was what we plotted here. And then I'm going to give it this smoothing function that I've defined. I guess one one small note too, if you're wondering what this syntax here is, this is what's called a decorator in Python. And this is just a cool little that will compile this function in a way that it will run really fast when we pass it into this generic filter. We can actually run this on very large images and it will it'll finish really fast. So when we do the smoothing, we can plot the result. So that's the smooth tights here. And when I plot this, this is now what we see, right? This is definitely giving us a better visualization and that you can see now we've got this really clear, these areas where there are some tall buildings are standing out really clearly, right? So you can start to see the industrial centers of the city, Midtown, Fidei, downtown Brooklyn, even a little bit in Long Island City. We've lost some resolution here. So in particular, the coastline. Uh, is now very smeared out. And that's because, again, we allowed all of these, we averaged over neighbors. So we can we can handle that by doing just some further kind of uh, massaging. And so what I'm doing here is I'm constructing an interpolation of the, going back to that LIDAR data, I'm, I'm constructing uh, an interpolation of that so that we have the LIDAR data in the same coordinates as our building heights. And then I'm going to just do some uh, filtering here so that everywhere that the LIDAR data says we're at sea level, right? So zero feet elevation, we're going to uh, send that back to zero elevation in, in this data set. And so the result of all of that is this, in my estimation, a uh, very pretty map that we get, right? So after doing that filling and smoothing, we can plot this and now you can see really clear the original coastline of New York City, all of those kind of geographic features, but also now getting a picture of elevation as humans see it in New York City with the really built up areas of the city sticking out. And I'm just doing this again in our Plotly library so that we can actually take a look at all of the, the height value we can zoom in and see, for instance, what the financial district looks like. Might take a couple seconds here to resize because the image is a little big. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think this is really fun and uh, we'll play with. Now, you can see that because we're still dealing with a, a limited resolution, when you zoom in really close, uh, some of the features do start to get a little coarse. And so in the last part here, I just want to show you how you can even extend this a little fun and make this a little fancier if you want to plot higher resolution maps of smaller areas of the city. One of the libraries that we can use for this is something 
called GeoPandas. So I think I mentioned pandas and I've mentioned some of the geographic or geospatial tools. GeoPandas is a really nice library that combines both of those things. And it's going to let us work with these shape files really easy. To start here, I just have some coordinates that define like a small, like a small subsection of the city. So I just picked these out of, I've right clicked in Google Maps, found what the latitude longitude coordinates were of an area of interest that I wanted to plot. So I have these, the Southwest coordinate and the Northwest coordinate that kind of define a, a So again, defining one of these transformers, I can convert these, these coordinates into a, the, the projection that the data sets are using that easting and, and I can read now here, I'm reading the, the building dot shape, right? So before we read building underscore P dot shape, which was just the points building dot shape is what contains the actual outlines of all of the building. And when I pass in this B box for bounding box parameter, it's only going to read that data that's inside of this small bounding box. So this is a way of, again, keeping the scope of what I'm working with smaller so that it's more computationally tractable. So when I look at what that loads up, it's only 7,564 buildings rather than that 1 million for our entire New York City data. This is what the actual data frame looks like. Uh, so you see all of these uh, pieces of information about the buildings. Again, we have the height of the roof, the ground elevation, and crucially, we have a geometry which contains a really big polygon field. So if we want to see what those polygons actually look like, we can just run this dot plot. And you can see here uh, just a quick plot of what the outlines of all these buildings. If you're familiar with New York City, maybe you can guess what this is. But I, I think pretty clearly this is Manhattan along Central Park. You can probably recognize the Met right there. Great. So we've got our, our kind of area of interest. But again, we're working with vector data at this point, and we need to do this. We need to do this conversion into raster data if we want to make maps that are combined with our elevation data. So, because we're dealing with these polygons now rather than just a single point, we have to do something a little bit fancier. So, what this code is doing is again, I'm constructing a grid, right? But now, instead of just defining points, what I'm doing is I'm actually constructing some polygons. Uh, a bunch of squares that represent our pixels. And you can see this, I'm calling this grid DF. You can see what's in this grid DF here. Again, we have an X and Y coordinate for the corner, but we're defining like a full like square of what that point represents. And then I'm going to do what's called a spatial join, which is like a, a geospatial specific operation that's going to intersect all of these polygons and look at what touches what. So we're going to see what buildings with their full outline actually intersect what grid points. So that's this S join operation here. And then again, I'm going to group by the X and Y index, I'll look at the elevation and take the max. This is a, a much fancier way of doing that gridding that I talked about above. And then kind of one more time, we'll convert this into a matrix. Again, making sure to order it Y index when we're, at, when we're indexing into a matrix. And then I can plot here just a quick visualization of what our raster data looks like now with the color corresponding to the heights. So now we have uh, kind of a, a rasterization of that data that I showed above. And you can see there's some tall buildings here as you go south towards Columbus Circle and it's showing up in that uh, green and yellow color. Great. So this kind of gives us a, a cookbook now for combining this more sophisticated polygon data into a raster format. And so what I've defined here is a set of functions that really take all of that process from end to end. If you're curious, you can read through these and get a sense of what they're doing. We have a function for uh, cropping and resizing our digital elevation map so that we can take just a kind of small piece of it. We have uh, a function for creating that grid that I talked about that's going to allow us to do a spatial join. One for uh, turning the building uh, data set into a raster map based on, uh, again, just a subset bounding box. And then we have our smoothing operations. And at the end of it, I've created a function here that's just going to take in two things with some options, uh, with, with some more optional arguments, but you're just going to need to provide a southwest corner in latitude and longitude and a northeast corner in latitude and longitude. Uh, of course, these have to be inside New York City because all of our data sets uh, are inside New York City. And what it's going to do is it's going to go through all of that stuff we talked about and return a figure uh, that you can actually plot. And I have an example plotted or plotted just down here where taking the same coordinates, but again, just giving it 
this southwest corner and this northeast corner. And then I, I adjusted my smoothing parameter here. But what you can see now is uh, a really zoomed in high resolution image of this kind of a gestalt rooftop topography uh, of this area of Midtown Manhattan or Manhattan around Central Park. Yeah, I think that's uh, about all I have to present. Happy to take questions from anybody, but I'd encourage uh, all of you, if you are familiar with Python or not, maybe a great way to jump in, but to take a look at this code and try plotting some of your favorite areas of the city. Is it, is, is it correct that the, the elevation was part of your data set for the building height? So in one data set, you can add them together and get the overall elevation from one data set, or was that necessary to be combined? So for instance, if you look at, so that I am getting the elevation above sea level of the buildings, but if you look uh, here, for instance, a lot of this, there's no buildings. And so there's no information. And so in these areas where there's no buildings, uh, I have to get that elevation from the original elevation map. And then the other thing is that I am using that elevation map to go back and sharpen up the coastline so that you get the really clear uh, geographic features and don't just blur out the boundaries and, and erase the rivers and stuff. From earlier, I believe it was Ryan who was asking which format we should download for the building footprint data. So if I go back up here, I have in this link, the original formats, right? So if you just run this command, what it's going to do is it's going to download uh, the original format, which super well documented, but that format is a zip file. And if you unzip that file, you will see it contains all of these things. So some uh, .shape files, .prj files, .dbf files. In particular, most of the things that I did were working with the .shp file format. Another question we had was, can was from Eden. Can Google Colab handle the original data size or is scaling it down necessary? Yeah. So I think I, I maybe touched on it at the beginning, but the answer was the the disk, the hard drive provided in the Colab is, is plenty to download all of this data. I've tried loading the, the TIFF file into RAM and yeah, it's probably going to crash or at the very least slow you down. Last question was from Regis. So I think it was towards the end of your presentation, Patrick, and Regis asks them, how are you using this information? So this was just a, kind of a, a, a curiosity project for me. Uh, I was aware of kind of these data sets and wanted to see if I could make some of these like maps. But I think that one thing I'll call out here too is that there's a ton of geospatial data on on the open data portal and you can what i'm plotting in all of these is is physical elevation or elevation of building rooftops and things like that uh, but there's all sorts of data sets out there that that are geospatially correlated uh, all of these tools you can use to plot whatever you're interested in there's a question here how would you start by only importing a small area of data like two council districts so that's a great question i believe the council districts are fairly certain there is a shapefile data that is provided that contains, similar to the building polygons, polygons for all of the council districts. So what you would do there is you'd want to load a, probably a set of, you'd load up those polygons from the council district. And then what you'd want is to take like the, the biggest possible bounding box, for, because when you are loading in, if you want to load a really big data set, but only load part of it, for instance, in this GeoPandas library that I talked about, you have to give it like a, a bounding box to restrict it, right? So you'd create the bounding box for those districts, load in all of your data. And then again, you do this spatial join operation between your, your district polygons and the, the polygons of the data you were interested in. So none of these data sets uh, that I talked about are, are by borough. I'm not sure what the like district polygons look like if they're separated by borough or not, but all of this data is just for all of New York City. Would you suggest doing these spatial operations in GIS software? So GIS software is definitely uh, like a different way to, to do a lot of these things. And in fact, a lot of, so for instance, I talked about GDAL, it was one of the tools we used. A lot of these things are things that have a Python interface as well as interfaces in traditional GIS software. They have, they're different tools. Uh, you can do a lot of the same things with both of them. Personally, I think one of the great things about doing things with Python is that it makes it really easy to connect different pieces. So if you want to say, do these kind of mapping and then take scrape data sets off of Twitter using you know, geotagging and stuff like that and combine them, right? You can do all that sort of stuff all in, whereas in traditional GIS software, it can sometimes be harder to incorporate other kinds of data or do, you know, maybe some of the, like this specific, like smoothing filter we built was very custom and some of that stuff might not be as easy in uh, traditional 
GIS software. Hey, Patrick, I want to uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I just had a quick question of yeah. uh, if you were to file in something like a uh, slope, the slope of New York City, uh, of the angle at which uh, the terrain is, what kind of data file would that be figured in that? Would it be more of a raster? Would it be a polygon? How would you input that data into something like this? Because I'm familiar with GIS and you know, yeah, being a 3D map, but this is the Python interface, more of a, seems to be a 2D base model. Yeah, so you could definitely, so that, that, that kind of stuff can definitely, it's, it can be a little harder to visualize. There are 3D plotting libraries in, in Python for sure. But yeah, you can definitely do that sort of thing in Python. Typically, if you're thinking about these sorts of uh, dense data sets where you want to know the sort of the slope of the, the terrain at every kind of point, you'd be thinking about a raster data. And in fact, you can probably do just off of this, off of this height data, 3D gradient operations that are going to give you a Again, you're going to have to represent it in a higher dimension, but we'll give you a, a slope. All right, great. Well, I think we're just about at time. Yeah, I really want to thank everyone. This was a lot of fun. And uh, thanks again to wonderful people at Open Data for putting on this uh, fantastic event.